Okay. So welcome to the Ali at SBU lecture series. Today we have Giuseppina Caravella. She's a healthcare specialist for the Stony Brook Cancer Center Office of Community Outreach and Engagement. What a mouthful. <laughs> she has her master's degree in public health and is a certified health education specialist. She attended Stony Brook for her undergraduate and graduate studies. And she is gonna to talk to us today about cancer prevention and screening. So just subpoena, you can get started and I will ask everyone if they'll mute themselves. If they have any questions throughout, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand, however you do that best. And we'll answer throughout the uh, throughout the presentation. Giuseppina, thank you for joining us. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. So um, like Elizabeth said, my name is Giuseppina, and I'm going to be talking to you about cancer prevention and screening. I just want to first say that I'm not a doctor, so um, I can't answer any like technical medical questions, but if there's something that I could take back my to my team and get back to you on, I'd be more than happy to do that. So first, I just want to tell you a little bit about Stony Brook Cancer Center. We are located on the hospital side of campus. Um, we used to be on a separate building up the hill, and now um, we're this new beautiful glass building that you see on my screen um, attached directly to the hospital. And uh, I have the Cancer Center's website and contact information listed on here, um, as well as their address. Um, and my office is the Office of Community Outreach and Engagement. And we are located within the Cancer Center. So basically, um, what our office does is we work with the community, the community being defined as Nassau and Suffolk County. And our goal is to do outreach and education in the community to ultimately decrease the cancer burden on Long Island. Uh, we work with researchers at the university um, to get word out about their research, to get word out about trials, also so that the public could understand about research. Um, we also go out into the community and we do education uh, with schools, libraries, uh, various different community centers. And um, we work with the Department of Health for the state and the county um, with cancer surveillance. So basically looking at the rates of cancers, what's popping up um, and you know how we can help impact that. So for today, we're gonna to start with what is cancer? We're gonna talk a little bit about what causes cancer, um, screenings that are available for cancer, how to prevent certain cancers. And then I have a whole bunch of resources to go through with you guys as well. <clears throat> okay, so what is cancer? Um, cancer is the uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells in our body. So every day, all the time, all the cells in our body are um, dividing. So cells in our eyes are dividing, cells in our skin are dividing, different organs. And while that's happening, mistakes can occur. So when mistakes occur, our body has a way of correcting those mistakes. So basically our body's natural process is to spot a mistake, and squash it, get rid of it. Cancer happens when that mistake isn't taken care of and is able to grow out of control. And so cancer cells are abnormal cells that grow and multiply at a fast rate. They grow out of control and this could happen in any part of our body and it could also spread to other parts of our body. So on the picture, um, you'll see an example of what normal cells look like. Everything is pretty even, pretty uniform looking. And then cancer cells is when an abnormality grows out of control. So the picture on the right. Um, cancer could be a solid tumor, or it could also be like a liquid tumor, which would be like a blood cancer. And Tumors don't always have to be cancer. So when you do have a tumor, it could be a benign tumor or a cancerous tumor. So if it is cancerous, they call it malignant. And when the cancer travels to different parts of the body, it's called metastatic. That's just a word to signify that it traveled from its original location. Okay, so what causes cancer? 
There are many risk factors for different cancers. Some are risk factors that you can change. So things that you have control over in your own life. And some are risk factors that you cannot change. So the risk factors that you cannot change are things that are important to be aware about and to know that you're at risk for, but there's really not much you could do about them. So risk factors you can change. Smoking is probably the most important one. Um, smoking is correlated with many, many different cancers. Probably you think of lung cancer right away, but um, smoking is also correlated with a number of other cancers. Um, and so quitting could greatly reduce your risk of cancer. Unprotected sun exposure is another big one. Um, skin cancer is very common. It's actually the most common cancer. And so protecting our skin from the sun is very important and that is something we can control. Alcohol use is also correlated with a number of different cancers. Um, I'll go into more detail about that later, but basically limiting or reducing your alcohol use can help also. Vaccine status. So there are a few vaccines that prevent against certain cancers, and I'll go into more detail about what those are. Lack of physical activity and being overweight or obese are also risk factors for cancer, and those are things that we can control. And not going for regular checkups and screenings are also associated with risks of cancer. So those are all things that we can change in our own lives. Now, the risk factors that we cannot change, um, it's just important to be aware of them. Aging, so unfortunately, we can't turn the clock back and um, a lot of cancer risk increases with age. Genetics and family history, so um, there's definitely a tie with genetics and cancer. Um, a lot of times you'll hear like, cancer runs in my family or there's a certain gene that we have. Um, so it's important to know about that if you can. If not, a lot of people might not be able to know because there's an adoption or something like that. It's good to know that actually most cancers are not genetically linked, um, but you know if you do have that gene, you are at an increased risk. So it's good to know about. Race and ethnicity is a risk factor for many cancers. Um, sex assigned at birth, just meaning um, if when you were born, if you were male or female, you would have certain risks for certain cancers depending on which sex you are assigned. Um, and then environmental factors and workplace exposures, I put an asterisk there because sometimes we can control them if we know about them. But if you don't know about them or you don't know that they cause cancer or you're not able to move even if you know that you're being exposed to it, then it could be a factor that you cannot change. So those two can kind of go in either spot. But you could think of like asbestos, right? Like years and years ago when people were working with asbestos, they didn't know that it caused cancer. So they didn't take certain precautions. So in that case, they couldn't change it because they didn't know that it was causing cancer. Okay, so now we'll go over some different screenings for various types of cancer. So the cancers that I have listed here in general are the cancers that we have screenings for. So if it's not listed here, then there's probably not a screening for it. So like you'll notice um, ovarian cancer is not listed and that's because there is no screening for ovarian cancer. Same with like kidney cancer, renal cancer, it's not listed here because there is no screening for it. But the list that I have here are cancers that we can be proactive and get screened for. So breast cancer, it's October, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, there are a number of different kinds of screenings. So uh, we say to start in your 20s and we start with knowing your own breasts. So basically knowing what's normal for you, feeling around, seeing if you have any lumps or anything that's concerning, but also some lumps and some bumps are normal. So just knowing what your normal is, knowing how it changes with your cycle. And we encourage women to begin that in their 20s. Then um, clinical breast exams are what happen at the gynecologist's office. That's when the doctor will check. And that usually happens annually. And then mammograms are the next type of screening. So mammograms are recommended to start at age 40. 
um, sooner if you have a family history or certain risk factors. So that's why I wrote or sooner there. So um, at the bottom of this table, you'll see my big disclaimer, talk to your doctor about risk factors, history, and whether you should have additional tests at an earlier age. So if you have certain risk factors or a family history, you would start mammograms younger than 40. Um, and those happen annually. Cervical cancer, um, the screenings available for cervical cancer are pap smear and HPV test. And um, that's recommended to start in your 20s. Um, and that happens at the gynecologist office. Um, used to be annually. They recently just changed it to every three years um, because the rates of cervical cancer have gone down dramatically recently. Um, and I'll, tell, I'll talk more about that later. Lung cancer. Um, so this is somewhat new, but there is a screening available for lung cancer. It's a low dose CAT scan. So a low dose CT. Um, the recommended age to start is in your 50s, and that's if you're at high risk for lung cancer. So insurance companies actually have a very um, technical definition of what that means. Um, and so I, um, I'll give more information about this later. But basically, if you have a 20-year pack history and you currently smoke or you quit within 15 years, and you're at the age of 50, then you would qualify for a lung cancer screening. A 20 year pack history means that you smoked one pack a day for 20 years or two packs a day for 10 years. So it's kind of simple math, but um, it's a 20 year pack history would define high risk. And that's basically when insurance will cover it. Oral cancer is uh, screened at the dentist office. So that's done by an oral exam and it's recommended to start around 18 years old. And when you go to the dentist, hopefully every six months or at least every year, um, they'll check the oral cavity and make sure and see if they see anything unusual, um, unusual patches or growths or anything like that that needs to be looked at. Colorectal cancer, there are a few different options for screening for colorectal cancer, but a colonoscopy is the gold standard. So colonoscopy is the best way to do it. Um, it allows doctors to visualize the entire colon. Also, while they're doing a colonoscopy, if they find a polyp or something suspicious, they can take a biopsy right then and there. So that's why colonoscopy is considered the gold standard. However, some patients are nervous about it or they don't wanna do it. And so some doctors will allow patients to do what's called a fecal immunohistochemical test. It's called a FIT test. It's a stool sample. So um, that's a second option for patients who will absolutely not undergo a colonoscopy. It's a kit that you take home. You produce a stool sample, you mail it back to the lab. And then if that test comes back abnormal, the follow-up is a colonoscopy. So it's kind of just like an extra step in between for patients who aren't ready to get a colonoscopy. But um, if it comes back abnormal, then you'd have to get a colonoscopy. The age for colonoscopy just recently changed. It used to be 50. Now it's 45. So 45 is the new 50 is the slogan. Um, we're trying to get the word out because even a lot of primary care providers are not up on that information. Um, so the age for colonoscopy is not 50 anymore. It's 45 now. Prostate cancer is another cancer that we can screen for. And there are two ways to screen for that. One is a blood test. It's called the prostate specific antigen blood test. Um, and that's pretty self-explanatory. It's just a, a blood test. Um, the other is called a digital rectal exam. And so that would be performed by a doctor and the doctor would use their fingers or digits. That's why it's called a digital rectal exam. And they would insert them in the rectum and they would feel for the prostate to see if they feel any lumps or anything abnormal. Um, the recommendation for prostate cancer is not 
as straightforward as the other cancers that I discussed. The recommendation for prostate cancer is to start talking to your doctor about prostate screening at age 50 or sooner if you have a family history. Um, prostate screening is not uniformly recommended for everybody to do in the way that the other screenings are. Um, prostate cancer is viewed more as a shared decision-making. So this is a conversation between a patient and their doctor to discuss if prostate cancer screening is right for them. Um, so it's not to say that everybody needs to do it, but it's a conversation that everybody should have. Skin cancer is another cancer that we can screen for. Um, that would be an annual skin exam that's done by a dermatologist. And again, this one is a little bit of a gray area. It's not a standard recommendation for everybody to do this, but it is an important conversation that you should have for your doctor based on your own risk factors, your sun exposure, your concerns. Um, and that's a decision that you can make with your doctor if you want to start doing that. <clears throat> This slide has the same information, but it's just broken down by age category. So it's just broken down a little bit differently rather than by age, by um, cancer type, it's broken down by age. So just like there are ages to start screening for cancers, there's also ages that it's recommended to stop screening for cancers. Um, and so the reason for that is because um, they recommend stopping screening for cancer when the risk of being harmed by the test outweighs the benefit of being helped by the test. So basically to decrease overscreening um, and to decrease false positives and to unnecessary testing and biopsies. So um, there would be age cutoffs, you know, and of course, if you want to continue screening past the age that's cut off, that's just a conversation to have with your doctor, and that should be fine if the doctor agrees. But um, in general, um, they say you can stop your colorectal cancer screening at 75, you can stop your cervical cancer screening at 65, um, and breast cancer. Um, they stop, you know, at 79, 80. Um, and so, you know, those are conversations to have with your doctor when you want to stop screening. But in general, those are the ages that they recommend stop screening. There's a couple other tests on here that you'll see that I didn't go over in the table. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about hepatitis later um, in this presentation. So you'll hear about that then. Okay. So how can we be proactive and prevent cancer in the first place? Um, there are a number of things we can do. So thinking back to those risk factors that you can change, we're gonna focus on those and see what kind of lifestyle changes we can make to help prevent cancer and reduce our risk. So starting with genetics and family history, knowing your personal family history and risk factors can help you know what you're at risk for. Um, if you're able to know your family history, it's a good thing to know because you can let your doctor know and then you can make decisions about screenings. If you need to screen in a different way, if you need to screen earlier, more often, um, family history could help you know a lot of that. In some cases, it's not possible to know your family history and that's fine too. Um, you know, genetic cancers, genetic reasons is not like the number one cause of cancer or anything like that. Um, it's a risk factor, but it's not to say that you're definitely going to get cancer if you have a family history of it. So it's a good thing to know, but if you can't know it, that's okay too. Don't freak out about that. Having health insurance is very important. Being enrolled in health insurance is important because then you can go for your regular doctor's appointments. You can go for your regular screenings. You can get all your preventive care. In most cases, preventive care and screenings shouldn't have a copay. Um, after the Affordable Care Act, a lot of those copays were taken away. So, um, you know, trying to eliminate as many barriers as possible and having health insurance is really important so that you don't have those financial barriers to keeping on top of your health. 
Um, and if you don't have health insurance, um, everyone, you know, is eligible to apply. Um, New York State has the New York State Marketplace. Um, and, you know, based on your income, it'll tell you what you qualify for. So smoking. Um, smoking was one of those big risk factors that we can change. So lung cancer is actually the leading cancer killer in both men and women in the United States. So it is the deadliest cancer. Um, nearly nine out of 10 lung cancers are due to cigarettes, either firsthand smoking or secondhand smoke. Um, not all smokers will get cancer and not only smokers will get cancer. So you could still get lung cancer if you were never a smoker. Of course, it's possible, but smoking will make it a lot more likely. Um, and e-cigarettes are not a safe alternative to cigarettes. Um, you know, they started out as being marketed as a way to help people quit, but that quickly changed and now people are getting hooked onto e-cigarettes and they're not much safer. Um, one jewel pod, which is like the liquid pod that you put into the e-cigarette, um, has the same amount of nicotine as 20 cigarettes. So it's actually highly addictive. Limiting alcohol consumption is also very important. Um, drinking alcohol raises your risk of six different types of cancer. Um, so mouth and throat cancer, voice box and larynx cancer, esophageal cancer, colorectal cancer, liver cancer, and breast cancer are all associated with um, overconsumption of alcohol. Uh, you might think of like liver cirrhosis or something like that, and that could lead to liver cancer. Maintaining a healthy lifestyle is very important. Um, if your body is in good health, it's in best shape to fight off disease, um, correct those cellular errors that happen. Um, so being in good shape, being healthy, um, having a good diet, a nice exercise re regimen that um, can help ward off cancer as well. So exercise is um, shown to reduce the risk of colorectal cancer, breast cancer, endometrial cancer, kidney cancer, bladder cancer, esophageal cancer, and stomach cancer. Um, that being said, exercise is not one of those things that you should just go from zero to 100. So you shouldn't just jump in and say, okay, I'm going to start running a marathon if you've never even walked around the block before. So it's one of those things that you have to work your way up to and you don't want to injure yourself. Um, and I have some resources that I'll go over later where I talk about some different ways to get information for that. Um, but it's important to pick an exercise that is good for you where you're at. And, um, you know, that is consistent, something that is not going to be too burdensome, something that you'll be able to stick to, um, you know, even as simple as walking up and down the steps when in commercials on when you're watching TV, that could be very effective. Um, and then having a healthy, well-rounded diet. I'm sure you've heard things like eat the rainbow, um, you know, eating a lot, lots of fruits and vegetables, varying multicolors. Um, myplate.gov is a general guideline of what your plate should look like. So um, sticking to a well-rounded, healthy diet can also help decrease your risk of cancers. Little bit about sun safety. So um, skin cancer is the most common cancer in the United States. One out of every five people will get skin cancer in their lifetime. Um, <clears throat> it's important for you to wear sunscreen and we advocate for people to wear sunscreen or something containing SPF year round. So SPF is the sun protection factor. It's basically just a number that tells you how strong the protection is against the sun. We recommend 30 or higher. So when you see a sunscreen bottle, you'll see SPF and then there'll be a number. So we recommend 30 or higher and we recommend that the bottle also says broad spectrum. Broad spectrum just means that it's going to protect you against the different types of rays that the sun gives off. So the sun gives off um, UVA rays and UVB rays. And so a broad spectrum sunscreen will protect you against both. We also recommend that it is water resistant, meaning that 
um, you know, it's, it'll help stay on when you get wet, but we do recommend reapplying it afterwards. So we recommend reapplying sunscreen in general every two hours, unless you go swimming, you sweat excessively, or you towel off within that two hours, then we recommend you reapply after doing that. Um, and we recommend you use one ounce of sunscreen per application or enough to fill a shot glass. And we highly advise against indoor tanning. So indoor tanning before the age of 30 has shown to increase the risk of melanoma by 75%. New York State recently passed a law um, changing the age to indoor tan to 18 years old. So as of right now, people under 18 in New York are not allowed to indoor tan, but um, it's not a good practice really for anybody. Um, there are alternatives like spray tannings, tanning lotions, um, tinted moisturizers, um, but yeah, tanning is highly associated with skin cancer. And when we talk about preventing skin cancer, it's really important to think about youth and to think about the children in our lives. Um, so the majority of your sun damage is done by the time you turn 18. So the majority of someone's sun damage that they'll have over their lifetime is done before they turn 18. And as a matter of fact, one blistering sunburn in childhood doubles your risk of getting skin cancer later in life. So um, it is important, you know, to seek shade, use sunscreen, and be smart about your sun exposure. So with skin cancer, it's important to spot it early if you can. So we talk about the A, B, C, D, E's of skin cancer. So the things to look out for are um, A, asymmetry. So meaning that it's not a regular shape. So you'll see the two examples next to the A. One is a perfect circle and one is more of this oblong, irregular looking shape. Um, B is border irregularity. So sort of the same as A, but this is talking specifically about the border. So the first picture has like a clean border. The second picture looks more like, it's kind of like bleeding out, like it's not a very sharp edge. C is color is not uniform, meaning that the color changes within the one mole. So the normal picture, um, that mole is all the same color. The other two moles next to it sort of have multiple colors going on in there. Diameter is greater than six millimeters. So um, in general, you'd want your moles and beauty marks to be smaller than six millimeters, which is about the size of a pencil eraser. If it's bigger, then that's something to be concerned about. And E is evolving in shape, size, or color. So basically things that are changing. Um, if you see something changing, if you suspect that something is not not right, if you suspect that something meets one of these criteria, it's important to talk to your doctor about it. Um, one thing that I wanna say is people with reduced immunity um, are at higher risk for skin cancer, um, people with a prior history of skin cancer, um, family history, those people should definitely consider talking to their doctors about annual skin cancer screenings. It's not recommended across the board, but it is an important conversation to have with your doctor. So certain medications that decrease your immune system could um, make you more susceptible to getting skin cancer. Also, people that have had an organ transplant can be more susceptible to getting skin cancer because of the medications that they need to take, those anti-rejection medications. Um, so, um, you know, it's just important to talk to your doctor about the risks factors that you have, the exposures that you've had, family history and medications that you're on and decide if skin cancer screening is right for you. Okay. So vaccination status, um, vaccination status is something that we can make a decision about that can help us prevent cancer. So there are actually two vaccines that are available that can help pr protect against cancer. The first is the human papillomavirus, um, the HPV vaccine. So 
Human papillomavirus is a virus that um, causes six different types of cancer. It is a very common virus. 80% of people will get HPV in their lifetime, 80, um, So it's very prevalent virus um, and it's responsible for causing six different types of cancer. It causes cervical cancer. It's like the number one cause of cervical cancer. Vulvar cancer, vaginal cancer, penile cancer, anal cancer, and oral pharyngeal cancer, which is cancer of the back of the throat. 90% of these cancers can be prevented by getting the HPV vaccine. The HPV vaccine is approved for all genders up to age 45. This vaccine first came out in 2006, and at the time it was only marketed towards girls, but since then, um, they have learned a lot more about the HPV virus, how it acts, how it spreads, and they've made changes to that recommendation. So now everyone is recommended to get the HPV vaccine. The recommended age to get it is 11 to 12 years old. <clears throat> you can get it as young as nine. Um, after 15, you're considered late. So if you get it after the age of 15, it's considered late and it goes up to three doses. It's two doses if you get it at the recommended age. And the reason for that is because you have a more robust immune response to it when you're younger. So you get a better response to it and you build up more antibodies. But if you're older, then you need a third vaccine to achieve that. Recently, it's been expanded to include all people up to age 45. The cutoff used to be 26, um, but they found that more people could benefit from it if they expand the age to 45. So really the HPV vaccine is available to anyone age nine to 45, and it is a cancer prevention vaccine that will prevent six different types of cancer. Another vaccine that will prevent against, that could prevent against cancer is the hepatitis B vaccine. So hepatitis B and C are viruses that are linked to liver cancer. Um, <clears throat> the important thing with hepatitis is it's important to know your status. It's important to know if you have hepatitis um, B or C. The good news for hepatitis B is there's a vaccine available. It's actually given at birth. Um, it's given to babies before they even leave to the hospital. Um, and then there's boosters that they'll get in childhood. If you've gotten it, <clears throat> then you're protected. If you haven't gotten it, then you should consider getting it. Um, unfortunately, hepatitis C does not have a vaccine. So there's really, um, there's no surefire way to protect yourself against it but you can get tested and treated for the virus. So knowing your status is important because there is treatment available. More than half of people living with hepatitis don't know that they have the virus. Um, there's usually not symptoms until it gets really bad. So a lot of people have no idea that they have it. Um, there's a little table on the bottom of the slide. You can see this, um, graph there. And it's basically showing you the ages of people that have hepatitis C. Um, and you'll notice two like peaks on the curve, right? So there's a peak in the 20s and 30s. And then there's another peak in the 60s and 70s. So people in their 20s and 30s are experiencing a peak in hepatitis C right now because of the opioid epidemic. So um, injection drug use uh, will put you at very high risk for contracting hepatitis C. And right now, um, you know, this age group is dealing with the opioid epidemic and a lot of people are contracting hep C, you know, in their late teens, 20s, and then they're testing positive for it in their 20s and 30s. There's also another large spike of people in their 60s and 70s that have hepatitis C and don't know that they have it. Um, many baby boomers have hepatitis C from when they were younger and they never realized it. Um, this was because at the time, medical procedures were 
you know, by nowadays standards, unsafe, but the risks at the time were unknown. So bloodborne illness like hep C was able to spread. Um, also, it's an, a sexually transmitted infection and it's caused by injection drug use. And, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, um, that kind of stuff was going on and people didn't really know about using proper protection. So um, that's kind of why you see those spikes in those age ranges. So I have some resources to go through. Um, this slide is split in two. So at the top, I talk about um, some screening uh, services and some, you know, um, primary care and GYN access. So these um, these services are for uninsured patients. So there's um, the Cancer Services Program of New York is a uh, New York State organization run by the Department of Health. And there's an office in each county. So there's an office in Nassau and an office in Suffolk. And I put their phone numbers there. And these are for uninsured patients to get screenings for breast cancer, cervical cancer, and colorectal cancer. So if you don't have insurance and you wanna get screened for those three cancers, Cancer Services Program will pay for the screening. Um, if you have a positive finding on the screening, they will also pay for the biopsy. So they'll take you up to the point of diagnosis. Um, then, you know, if you are still uninsured and you're diagnosed, um, the social workers at the hospital can help with trying to get you insurance, trying to see if you qualify for Medicaid. Um, and if that's not possible, they could look into getting emergency Medicaid for you for treatment. But uh, Cancer Services Program is great because they'll take you through the screening process. And then also if biopsies are needed, they'll cover that. Stony Brook Home is a primary care clinic that is run through Stony Brook Hospital. It's in Patchogue. Um, that's the phone number there. And this is primary care for adults that are uninsured. And Access GYN is a gynecologic clinic that's also run through Stony Brook Hospital. Um, and this is for uninsured patients and it is located in Bohemia. On the bottom half of the slide, I have listed some smoking cessation programs. So Suffolk County offers one, learn to be tobacco free. Stony Brook Hospital has our own cessation program. The phone number is there. New York State has New York State Quit Line. And then there's also a texting line to text drop the vape for people who vape. So these resources could, you know, help people with like coaching, also with things like the gum or the patches um, to help them quit smoking. Um, and I'm going to give Elizabeth a copy of these slides. So don't feel like you have to write down all these phone numbers and everything. Some more resources I wanted to show you. Um, so I have two websites here. One is Stony Brook's Lifestyle Medicine website. Um, and one is health.gov, My Health Finder. So they're actually both really cool resources. Um, I can click through and show you guys what they look like because I think they're kind of worth that. <clears throat> so can you guys see my screen? This is the lifestyle medicine website through Stony Brook. Um, when you scroll down, you'll get to this toolbar on the left, and then there's all different topics there. You can look at internal resources, meaning that they're resources within Stony Brook Hospital, you could look at local resources, meaning that they're resources on Long Island, or you could look at virtual resources, meaning they're resources on the computer. Um, and then there's different categories. There's food, movement, relaxation and awareness, creative arts, yoga, tai chi, qigong, sleep and rest, care and connections, and health patterns of behaviors. And then if you click on any given one, say tai chi, and it'll bring you to this 
page where it has all information about Tai Chi resources. So this is an eight week program that's offered through Stony Brook Hospital. It says it's currently on Zoom. So you can click on that if you want more information. Here's some local Tai Chi studios. So um, there's one here in Sound Beach listed, one in Port Jefferson. Um, and then here's some virtual Tai Chi exercises through the Arthritis Foundation. So, you know, you can click through and get a feel for um, here's movement. So then they'll give you some resources, um, you know, for different types of movement, maybe like walking groups um, or things like that. So this is a great website. There's a ton of information on it. You can click through it for hours um, and see what kind of resources are out there, um, you know, for all these different lifestyle categories. The other one is this My Health Finder. This is a really cool tool where you could put in your age and your sex, and then it will tell you what kind of screenings and what kind of questions and things you should be talking to your doctor about. So say I'll put in age 50, I'll say female, and we'll get results. Then this will tell you what, according to, you know, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, what a 50-year-old woman should be thinking about, talking about with her doctor. So then you can click if you want more information about a specific topic. So they recommend blood pressure screening, breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, colorectal screening, hepatitis C screening, HIV testing, talks about vaccinations, a well visit. STI testing, um, alcohol, depression, drug use, the list goes on. But basically you can get a tailored list of what, um, you know, you should be thinking about for your age and your sex and what, what kind of screenings you should be looking into. Am I back on my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> okay. Another resource I wanted to talk to you about is um, the Vial of Life. So this is a resource that we have access to through Stony Brook. I'm actually going to bring Elizabeth a bunch of these um, for anyone that goes in person or has the access to go to campus. Um, Basically, Vial of Life is designed to speak for you when you can't speak for yourself. This is something that um, EMT, firefighter, emergency personnel in New York are trained on. The kit consists of this, um, you know, medical bottle, like this uh, orange prescription bottle, and basically a paper that you fill out with all your health information on it. And then a sticker that you put on your refrigerator so that the first responders would know that you have this. So first responders are trained to look for this because everybody has a refrigerator. So, um, you know, not everyone has a coffee table, not everyone has a kitchen table. Some people have different setups in their house, but almost everybody has a refrigerator. So um, when they come to your home, the EMTs are trained to look at the refrigerator and see if they see this sticker. And if the sticker's there and they open it, your vial is inside your refrigerator. So then they'll pull out this prescription bottle and inside will be this paper with all your information written on it. Medications, prior surgeries, emergency contacts, um, medical conditions, and so all your information is in one place and available for the first responders. Um, so, you know, there's a website on here if you want to order one. I think it's like $5 if you want to order your own. Um, but I am going to provide a bunch of these as well um, for anyone that's able to come and pick them up. Um, I want to give some attention to clinical trials. Clinical trials are an important part of what we do here at the Cancer Center. Um, clinical trials in general are important, not just cancer clinical trials, but um, what we, we have our own clinical trials office here at Stony Brook, and I have their information on here, um, as well as two other resources to find out more information about clinical trials. So there's clinicaltrials.gov, 
which is a national repository for any and all clinical trials that are happening in the country. So if you have a diagnosis of something or you're just interested in getting involved in a clinical trial, you can look through and see if there's anything that you might qualify for. And then at the bottom, there's another cancer specific, which is um, through the National Cancer Institute. And that's a phone number where you can help, uh, where you can talk to somebody who can help you learn more. Um, clinical trials are important because if it weren't for clinical trials, we wouldn't have any of the current medications that we do have. So, um, you know, there's always risks involved, but um, the medicines of tomorrow will come about because of clinical trials that are being conducted today. So it's always good to know your options and to know if you qualify for any trials and really learn more about them so you can make an informed decision. So our office um, provides health education presentations and materials. We have printed materials, we have rack cards. Um, we do presentations both virtually and in person. So at the end, I'll give you our contact information. And this is what our flyer looks like. Um, we can talk about various types of cancer screening and prevention. Um, we go out in the community, businesses, schools. Uh, we have a Spanish speaker, so we are able to do them in Spanish as well. Some other resources through the Cancer Center um, is our mobile mammography. I don't know if you guys have seen, but she was recently made a little famous. So she recently did her 5,000 mammogram screening last week. Um, and so we were on News 12 and PIX11 and CBS. So it was really exciting for us. So now she's done 5,000 screenings. She's a mobile unit. Um, she goes to all different locations. She goes to the Sun River clinics all throughout the county. She goes to libraries. She goes to businesses so women can get a mammogram on their lunch break. Um, so um, as long as you meet the criteria, you can get your screening done on our mobile unit. And that's something that could be booked, you know, if someone was interested in having them come to their organization. Um, the lung cancer program, I said I would talk a little bit more about that. So we do have a lung cancer screening program at Stony Brook. Like I said before, this is a low dose CT for individuals who are defined as high risk. So high risk is between age 50 and 80 and having a 20 pack year history, meaning that you smoked one pack a day for 20 years or two packs a day for 10 years. Um, and I have the phone number on here to call if you're interested in learning more about the screening program to see if you qualify and to make an appointment. Another grant that we have in our office is the Cancer Prevention in Action Grant. This is a grant through New York State um, for our office to do specific education around sun safety and the HPV vaccine. So these are two of um, the most important cancer preventions that we can do. And so HPV vaccination and protecting our skin against the sun together could greatly reduce our risk of cancer. And so our office has a specific grant to cover these two topics um, in the community. And I threw a ton of information at you. So does anybody have any questions? I don't see anything in the chat, but if anybody wants to raise their hand virtually or just unmute yourself. Rita, I see Rita Edwards, unmute yourself. There you go. Would you give that telephone number again, please? The lung cancer one? The cancer prevention. I live in Jefferson's Ferry and we would like to have someone lecture here. Oh, sure, sure. Um, I don't think I had, yeah, I have it on the last line. So it's 631-444-4COE. Uh, that's our number, and this is our email, coe at stonybrookmedicine.edu. Okay, thank and you. Some of, and some of the resources that Giuseppina has provided in this, um, <clears throat> in this presentation 
we're going to be sending it out so people have it readily available to them. Yes. Um, any other questions? Any other questions? I have a quick question. Uh, do you have need people to volunteer in your office to help with anything with outreach or whatever? Um, yeah, so right now, all the volunteering is going through the hospital's main volunteer office. Um, and I think since COVID, they sort of slowed down on that. Like the cancer center used to have um, our own volunteer program and we would have volunteers um, giving out like soup and stuff to patients while they were in infusion. And it was lovely. The patients and the volunteers loved it. Um, but right now, just because of cancer patients being immunocompromised and, you know, the risk of COVID, they're limiting the number of people that can come into the cancer center. But um, the hospital's main website does have a volunteer office. And so there might be opportunities through that. Josephine, what's the phone number again? 444? Mm -hmm. 4COE. I'll go back to that slide. I'm just putting it in the chat for everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, in the chat, Kathy asked for the lung cancer screening. That's 631-638-7000. And that'll take you right to our lung cancer screening program. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? It was a lot of information. There's got to be questions. <laughs> I think she did such a good job. That's why there aren't that many questions. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you. Great job. Thank you so yeah. much. You covered everything. Thank you. I actually, I have a quick evaluation link. It's a survey monkey. I'm going to put it in the chat. If anybody has a moment, and they want to go there um, and just quick uh, fill out a quick evaluation. The link is in the chat. Um, also, if you, you know, wanted to contact us or, you know, request more information, I'm going to give Elizabeth all, the, you know, I'll give her the information to share with you guys. And I'm going to bring the vial of lives. But if you need to contact us for any other reason, I'll leave this info up here. And I'll stay on for the next few minutes in case anyone thinks of anything or wants to jump in and ask a question. I have a comment. Go ahead. I, I, I heard some of the lectures because I attend the Stony Brook uh, Mall Walkers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, once a month. And uh, there was often uh, the, the lectures about various screenings, but one was for colorectal, one was for lung, and then another one for risk and cancer. So yes, uh, and we're doing a breast one. I want to say at the end of this month, we'll be there. All right. Uh, so will I. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> um, do you want to go back? Did, didn't you have a page of resources? Um, yeah. If you want yeah. to just clarify, <clears throat> it was the page we, we spoke about the other day, mm -hmm. that one, yeah. Um, I just, uh, if you want to just, you know, reiterate that the resources on top are for uninsured. Yeah, so cancer services program is through the New York State Department of Health, and that's for uninsured patients. Um, and there's a Nassau office and a Suffolk office, and they provide screenings for breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer. Um, and then if there's a suspicious finding on the screening, they'll also pay for the follow-up imaging and biopsy um, <clears throat> for that patient. Um, unfortunately, they can't pay for the treatment. So that's when it gets a little iffy if the patient's uninsured and the social workers and stuff will work with them, you know, to try to get enrolled into insurance. But um, it's for the screening and diagnosis phase. Yeah, that's great. And then Stony Brook Home is our primary care clinic for uninsured patients. And that's in Patchogue. And Access GYN is our gynecologic clinic for uninsured patients. And that's in Bohemia. Got it. A lot of information. So if no one has any other questions, um, like Giuseppina said, she's going to drop off these vials to our office. So we'll make them available to everyone. Um, anybody that wants to stop in and pick them up, I think they're great because everyone, you know, you don't always know your family members or your, you know, your parents or whomever. You don't know what their 
mm-hmm. you know, what they're taking all the time. And I think it's a great, um, a great idea um, when you're in an emergency situation like that. So we'll have those available at the office. Um, any other questions real quick? If not, then we'll wrap this up and we'll just thank you so much for doing this. This is really good information. I think everybody needs it, no matter what age. <laughs> Yeah, thank you guys so much. Yeah, we do them for all ages. So, you know, I think it's important just for everyone to know what, you know, what's out there, what's available, what they should be doing. Yes. Yeah. A lot of times people are just scared to ask. They don't want to know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but no, it's good to have all this information. So we'll we'll get a copy of all this for everybody and we can uh, we'll send it out in our newsletter so that everybody has a has a packet of information and uh just a peanut thank you 